Well, what I want to do in this next session, when, we, when I planted the church, however long ago, 13 years ago, um, I had these big dreams in my head of what I wanted the church to look like. And I think I got the majority of those uh, big dreams from the Bible. I'd go to the Bible and see how the, how the church gathered, how the elders functioned, who led the church, how it looked, what the people did, um, how the community looked, what the preaching looked like, all this kind of stuff. I had this picture, of, this biblical picture in my head. And then I looked at the church I was a part of. I was a youth pastor at the time, and that's not the way we did, any, did things. And then I came from another church where I got saved at. That's not the way they, they did everything. Specifically on leadership, they had the CEO model. And the senior pastor could do whatever he wanted. So any staff member that disagreed with him, he'd fire him. And it was like this constant cycle of he was at the top and everybody else was just constantly turning over. And, I, and he kind of did all the ministry and everybody else just kind of came and listened to him teach. And I was like, man, this doesn't seem right to me. So as I started going to the Bible, getting this understanding of like what the early church looked like. And I thought, okay, how, how am I going to build that here when most people have never really experienced that? I came up with this thing that, that I called napkin theology, okay? Napkin theology. And what it was, was I was having to have all these meetings with people, and I was trying to tell them I'm going to start a new church, and this is how we're going to do things. And I could just see, like, th their eyes glaze over, and they just kind of disappeared into the ether. And I was like, wait, I couldn't really explain it. So then I came up with this thing where I just started drawing pictures on napkins, all right? Like, I'm at a bar and I'm talking to somebody about what the church I'm going to plant. And I, I would just draw these little pictures on the, on the napkin. And I called it napkin theology. And that's what I'm going to do for you guys today. All right. And we're going to do a little bit of napkin theology. Then we're going to get to something else. Um, if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn your Bible. This is, could also be called our philosophy of ministry. The way we do ministry here at Sacred City. All right. If you've got your Bibles, you can go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. If you're there, somebody say there. 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 All right. Somebody want to read it for me? Nobody wants to read it. Okay. All right. You can read it. All right, you hear that? So first off, you need to know, but you, that you is plural, okay? That's a plural you. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to Christians, okay? So think of it like this. You, as the church, are a chosen race. You've been chosen by God. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now, this is what I want you to hear. Look, you've been chosen, you've been called, you've been made he wants to possess you, right? You hear this kind of bringing you in together into a community. Now look at this. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. All right? This is, we call ourselves a missional church. Gospel-centered. Oh yeah, I don't even know about your notes. It's probably in there. A gospel-centered missional church. Our main message is the gospel. You're going to hear it every single Sunday. You should hear it in every single missional community setting. And a gospel, the gospel is something that pulls us in and sends us back out. It pulls us in. It gives us a new identity. We see that right there. Uh, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession. So he pulls us in. And then he, what does he say? That you could proclaim that you can proclaim the message, that you can share the gospel. So we have been called and we have been sent. Here's how I would describe that in my little barroom uh, meetings that I would have with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most, how do I want to do this? I'm going to do it like this. Sorry. I need a napkin. That's right. Beer would be nice too, actually. Sorry, guys. All right. Yeah, he's kind of a, all right. Here's the church. Here's the church that I grew up in. No, I mean, it didn't really look like that, but you know, I'm not an artist. My wife's the artist. Well, that's a that's a long roof line right there. 
All right. This was how I grew up. This is how most churches exist. They exist, and the goal is to get people to come to a Sunday morning gathering, maybe even a Wednesday night. Oh, wow. Maybe that's my left hand. Maybe even a Wednesday night gathering. But the goal is to get people to come in and then the professionals do the ministry. Professional singer, professional band, professional preachers. And this, we learned in the first session, can be called consumerism. The same reason I go to Walmart, I go there to get my groceries, that's it, I'm out. I'm in, I get what I want, I'm out. Nothing's required of me but to pay my bill, right? Many people treat the church like this, and this is the church that I grew up. It's just a place that you go to, to receive spiritual goods and services. But the way the Bible talks about the church is the church, the saints, remember, the the called out ones, the called out ones and the sent ones. So I said, this is the original, this is what most people think of church. But when the church that I want to plant, and I think the church in the Bible is a church of people, church is God's people, saved by God's power for God's purposes. So hopefully you got more than, this is just my family right here. Hopefully you got more than this on a Sunday morning, but whatever. That's about what we started with. They are the sent ones. So these people, they do come together to worship God on a Sunday morning, but they come together for the purpose of worshiping God, and then they're sent back out into the world to live as missionaries and God's holy people out in the world. So the church is God's sent ones. Right? Remember this, as the Father sent the Son, Jesus sent his disciples, and the Holy Spirit and the Father's Son sent the church, right? So we are God's people who don't just exist for ourselves in a little kind of holy huddle on a Sunday morning. We come in to receive encouragement, to be reminded that our sins are forgiven, to get to worship our great holy God. But then every single Sunday, the last thing we do is what's called a benediction, right? A good word. And you are sent out, right? You're sent out. And there's usually some kind of missional language in that sending, in that, in that benediction. Go out now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and live like you believe it. Live like a sent one. Live like a Christian, right? So this is, so this is my first little napkin. I would say this is, a lot of churches are like this, a little church. Everybody, it just, the whole thing is just to come on Sunday. That's not the church that we want to plant. We want a church that comes together as the sent ones and then goes back out and live in the world. So the church isn't a building. It's the people of God sent to do, accomplish the mission of God. All right? We good? All right. Um, another thing with that, origi- that first picture, that's, I mean, I kind of said it when it's churches that are built just to bring people in on Sunday morning operate like a business. I hate to say, this is bad, this is ugly language, but if you've been in the church world long enough, that churches that operate as a business care about butts in the seat, tithes coming into the bank account, and maybe baptisms and salvations, right? But that's, that's what they market, that's what they go for, that's what they count, that's what they measure, that's what they care about. And I had been a part of churches that had grown kind of large, on that model. And I saw they're not actually making disciples. These people can't share the gospel with their neighbor. These people aren't living in community. They're not much different than their neighbor at all. They just come here for two hours or an hour. Back then, it was about an hour and a half. They come here for an hour and a half a week. And what's that going to do? Right? That's church as a business, not church as the sent people of God. All right? So we want to do things different here at Sacred City. Turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. This is a very important passage of Scripture where we see the early church. Acts chapter 2, we'll start in verse 42. All right, this is right after Peter preaches his powerful sermon. 3,000 people get saved. And this is what happens 
right after this great revival, this great move of God happens. Verse 42. I'll go ahead and read it. If you're there, say there. And they, that's the church, the people, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So we have this, they're gathering together, they're listening to somebody preach, the apostles were preaching and teaching, and the fellowship, there's a a community piece there, right? That's what fellowship means. To the breaking of bread, that, that's, eating, that's eating together. That could also be the Lord's Supper and, and the prayers. Do you see it says the prayers? Why, why would it not just say and praying? Anybody got a guess? There's different types of prayers. All right, has anybody ever wondered why we have words on the screen that we all recite and we say together? Prayers that come up on the screen. The reason we do that is because the early church had liturgy. They had confessions. The earliest confession is Christ is Lord, right? And part of the way we pray on Sunday morning isn't just to express ourselves to God, but it's to teach us how to pray, right? We learn how to pray by praying prayers that are better than what we would do extemporaneously. You guys, the prayers that we pray on Sunday or even the confessions, does your personal confession sound like that? Do your personal prayers sound like that? No. About, 20, no. about 29 years of my life, my prayer of confession was, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. Very simple, but that, just a blanket, I'm not really going to think about what I did today, but I know I screwed something up, so just cover me, <laughs> right? That's fine, but the Bible also teaches us how to pray and how to confess our sins. And when you go to the book of Psalms, when David confesses his sins, he's very explicit. He's very direct, right? He's not just, it would be really lame if the book of Psalms were one, just one sentence like our, our lame prayers usually are. So on Sunday mornings, we want to devote ourselves to the prayers, right? Historical prayers, um, prayers that we find in other places in the scriptures. That's what the early church did. Verse 43, and awe, that's like awe or wonder, came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Hear that. When it says they had all things in common, it didn't mean they got together and they're like, oh, you fish? Oh, I fish too. Oh, you, you shop here? Oh, I shop here. Like they had those things in common. It meant that they shared their goods they, shared, they opened their homes. They shared their homes. They shared their tables. They shared their finances. You're going to see that. Look. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This means if they had a poor brother and sister come into the missional community and they couldn't pay their bills or there was, they had, had some kind of financial hardship, somebody that was you know, more well off and they had extra things could sell some of those things to take care of those among them. All right? So they were radically generous. And look what the Lord did. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple, so they came to the church together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And I love this right here. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. God added to their number day by day. Not just every Sabbath day. Every single day people were coming to faith. Why? Because they were living in community and on mission. They were living in community and on mission. When Jesus said, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, he wasn't telling them to go teach a class, a discipleship class. How did Jesus disciple his disciples? He lived life with them. Anybody else? He lived life with them, okay? The way we say it around here is in community and on mission, all right? In community and on mission. I got another napkin for you.
So we say the only way to make disciples is in community and on mission. We say that not because we're arrogant and we think we came up with something cool. We say that because that's how Jesus made disciples. So when Jesus sent his disciples, he wasn't saying go reinvent the wheel, figure out a new discipleship strategy, see what's going to work in all these different cultural contexts. You guys just make it up as you go. He was saying, what I've done with you, you go do with others. And then in Acts 2, that's the kind of life they did, right? Eating together, praying together, listening to preaching together, inviting people day by day, worshiping God, having the Lord's Supper. They're living life in community and on mission, right? So let's just say this is the day you believe the gospel for the first time. This is the day that you're, you understand Jesus Christ died for my sins. I'm a new person in Christ. You get welcomed into the church. You get welcomed in, into the body of Christ. Now, I say, we say this a lot. This is where God met us, right? We don't, you, could be a, you could have been a complete pagan. You could have been the biggest sinner on your block. Honestly, it doesn't matter. God meets us where we are. But God loves us too much to leave us where we are. And so he wants us to mature and to grow. How are we to mature and to grow? Most Christians believe in our culture today, just start reading your Bible. You want to grow? Just start reading your Bible. And so Christians think, well, this is how I grow. I just take my 10 minutes, my 20 minutes, my 60 minutes in the morning. I read my Bible and then I'm just going to grow. Show me where Jesus says that in the Gospels right? It, is the word of God important? Absolutely. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word of God is living and active, sharp, sharper than a two-edged sword. But if you want to grow as a disciple of Jesus, there's only one way to do it, and that's in community and on mission. All right, now let me show you why. God saves me into a community. We call it the church, broken down. That can be your missional community. This is where I said it two weeks ago, we have a, well, I said it today too, I think we have a reflective identity, a relational and reflective identity. We, we, have a, uh, we, we learn from being in relationship with people. So like I said, I don't know how to pray. I can read the Bible, I can pray some scripture, but then when I join a missional community and I hear these dudes pray, I'm like, whoa, they pray better than me, right? I'm like, oh, that, I want to learn to, I want to learn to pray like that. How do I learn to pray like that? By praying like they do. Many times. Jesus taught us, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? He taught them how to pray in community. And then also, if I'm in community and I can't pray, maybe a brother comes alongside me and says, hey man, what do you know about prayer? How have you learned to pray? I've got somebody in my life that could actually coach me in how to prayer, could disciple me into prayer. Right? So, the gospel, bring, the gospel brings me into this new community. Right? And then this is interesting. The gospel tells me I'm a sinner. The only way I can be saved is through Christ. I confess my sins right here. I get brought into a community. But then I get in brought into this community. And you know who's in this community? Other sinners. And what do other sinners do when I get in a community? Anybody? Sin. They sin. <laughs> they sin. Right? Somebody says something dumb to me in community. Right? Somebody says something hurtful to my wife in community. Then I knock them out. Then I got to repent, go back to this part. No. <laughs> right? Okay, this is, so here's what happens. This is why I'm, I'm bringing this up. When I get brought into com community, many times we go into a community, and if we find sin there, we bounce out of that community. Whoa, I didn't like that person. I didn't like that personality. That bothered me. This bothered me. We bounce. When we do that, we short circuit our own discipleship. We short circuit it. Because what this is meant to do, when I go into community, I'm, I'm supposed to meet some difficulties in this community that push me deeper into the gospel. Why does that person bug me so much? Because my mom was just like that. Why do I have, what's, what's going on in my heart that causes me to get so annoyed at that person? Maybe it's my pride. Father, I, I can see that. And, and maybe my community... Are, I say, this person bugs me. And maybe a brother in my, church, in my community says, what's going on there? Why does it bother you so much? 
Right? Love covers a multitude of sins. Why can't you just brush that off? Well, because, and it's revealing immaturity in my heart. It's revealing a lack of discipleship in my heart. And so <clears throat> going deeper into community, look, pushes me deeper into the gospel. I, be, I, I begin to believe the gospel, not just with my head, but with my heart. That I am saved by sheer grace. I'm brought into this community by grace. God's changing me by grace. And he's going to be using these other imperfect people to sanctify me, to make me more like Christ. All right? Now, <clears throat> we've talked about this a little bit before. Community is not the only thing to do that. <clears throat> we're not just a community. We're a missional community. And so there will be things, many of you, if you come in and you're brand new, you're going to get into a community and you're going to see people pray better than you, or you're going to see people have insights, biblical insights. They're going to have a lot of wisdom, maybe. They're going to have <clears throat> a lot of knowledge of the, the scriptures. And all of those things are good. And they're all meant to cause you, you, cause you to grow. But you, then you're going to be hit with this reality that, man, I'm not just here for myself. I'm actually here to be on mission. And it does something unique in your life when then you begin, you begin to say, okay, what I'm learning here, what I'm learning in the gospel, what I'm learning in community, how can I bring that to work? How can I share that with my neighbor? How can I share that with my sister? And that, that good news of the gospel <clears throat> is going to push you to be on mission. And sometimes, like our missional community, one of the things we do, once a month, we serve at a nonprofit. Ev nearly every time that comes up, my first thought is, I ain't got time for this. A Friday night, I got five kids, I got stuff all over, the I ain't got time for this. Okay, that's my thought, my first thought. Then what do I have to do? I have to remember the gospel. Jesus Christ had plenty to do in heaven and he left heaven to come to this earth to save me. Jesus was sent, Jesus put aside his wishes and his wants to come do the Father's will, right? We call this gospeling ourself. We learn how to do this, gospeling ourselves. So yes, I'm a missionary, so I'm going to go and serve my community. I'm going to be on mission. And then let's just say you bring some you, you know, you you're on mission and somebody Somebody comes in and they come into your community and now your responsibility is to disciple them. Remember, Ephesians 4, God's given you, oops, sorry, God's given you pastors to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Your work, your ministry is to make disciples. Every person in here. And the only way to do that is in community and on mission, when you have a team of people doing it together. You might bring a person into your community and you might not even have much in common with them, but somebody else in your community does and they connect with them and they go have coffee with them and they start working out with them and they have them over for dinner and whatever, right? I want you to think, being a missionary isn't a solo endeavor. You're a part of a community that's doing it together. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry guys. All right, so the only way to make disciples is in community and on mission. And as I grow as a missionary, I come to understand the gospel in greater ways. As I grow in community, I come to understand the gospel in greater ways. All right, any questions on that? All right. <clears throat> well, how, what do I do with this? How do we, so this is, what, this is why we do missional community, right? The only way to make disciples is in community and on mission the way that Jesus did it. <clears throat> what, what does it look like when I get down on the individual level? How to make disciples? Really wish I had other colors up here, sorry. How to make disciples. We say it kind of simply around here that you, every single human being, 
It's called the Venn diagram, if you don't know. We just say it simply head, heart, hands. Okay, this is the sweet spot right here. Head, heart, hands. That means when you are becoming a disciple or you're making a disciple, there are things that you have to learn, right? Things that you have to know. Scripture, very simple. <clears throat> there are things that you have to learn to love. That's the heart. And then there are things that you have to do. Now, what happens if a community only focuses on what you have to do? Anybody? Okay, what does that feel like? What does that look like? What? Okay, it makes you really busy? Not genuine? Dumb? <laughs> Dumb. Yeah, no, you're not thinking about anything? Just do it, right? Okay. All right, it also becomes legalism. Have you ever heard that term legalism? Legalism is here's a big long list of things that you need to do to make God happy. Many people come out of a religion like that. That's not Christianity, right? This, we're going to say this is gospel, this, this is good news, this is scripture. There are things that God wants to um, renew our mind. So there's a whole new way of thinking that God offers us as a disciple of Christ. And so there's going to be, in, in, in times of missional community, when you're speaking up and you're having issues or concerns or something's going on in your life, there's going to be people that, that, that need to speak the good news to you. And to speak the gospel to you, and you need to have open ears to hear it, right? But there's also this love piece, this, you could call it your affections, you can call it your emotions, it's a little sketchy when you get into emotions, but that there's a, God doesn't want us just to know things, and he doesn't want us just to do things, he wants us to be operating out of a genuine love for him. He loves us first, and so we love him back. And sometimes there's a disconnect. We've heard people say this a lot, like, I get that in my head. I know that's true. But I just can't do it. Something like that. And when that's the case, there's usually what we would call a heart issue. There's a heart problem. The way I would say it after today's sermon, they love something else more than they love God. Right? So I, I'm just going to use it like this. You're talking to... Men, you're talking to another man about an issue of pornography or ladies, another lady about an issue of pornography. I know it's wrong. I don't want to do it, but I still do. Why? Because you love something you shouldn't love more than God. It might be comfort. It might be control. It might be who knows what it is, but it's love. And if you don't get to the heart of the issue... You're never going, you'll never really change. You've got to get to the heart. So in missional communities, one of the ways that we do this, because we want to engage the head, the heart, and the hands, is we do it by telling stories. What do I mean by telling stories? We share our story, how God, our background, maybe sometimes it starts with just, here's my problem, and then people ask us questions and it work back. Or sometimes we start by sharing our stories. This is the house I was raised in. This is the type of family. This is when I came to faith. This is what my mom was like, my dad was like. This is some of the issues that came out of that. And people ask us questions in order to be, first off, they're being really good listeners. Remember that, listening with gospel ears in order to, to speak good news to us, right? But also to get to the heart of the issue. Many times, um, a, a, a man won't know why he's doing some of these things that he's doing, and it gets down to what we call a father hunger or a father wound. He never had a dad he could count on. He never had a dad he could trust. He never had a dad who could love him. And so he can't receive the love of the father because he doesn't even know what that feels like. See, our fathers were meant to father us like God fathers us. Our, we are meant to grow up knowing the love of the father, and then when we meet God the father, he's the perfect father, we have a category for that. 
But if we didn't have a father, we won't have a category for that. And we'll be thinking, no, he's just trying to get something out of me. He just wants me to do something. He just wants me to give my money or go to church or do my thing. You know, we, we can't get our minds around that. No, no, he wants our heart. So real discipleship is going to in- involve the whole person, head, heart, and hands. And that means it's going to be messy sometimes. If you haven't been a part of a messy MC night, you haven't quite lived yet. <laughs> They're coming, I promise. Why? Because we're messy people. And the church for too long has wanted clean discipleship. Clean discipleship. Guys, there's no problem here when I'm just teaching you and I'm just pretty much up here in the head. Everybody shakes their head. Nobody wants to say anything. You might leave here and go, that guy's an idiot, right? You might say that, but you're not doing it right here. But once you start getting into people's heart, once you start getting down into their story, anger can flare up, anxiety flares up, fear, all kinds of emotion, right? One of the things that we, 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 we say a lot, like when was the first time you felt that? Somebody gets real angry in missional community, real fearful or whatever. More than likely, that's coming from someplace in their story. So, how to make disciples. you got to learn some things. we got to believe some things in our heart. And then we're going to eventually have to do some things if you're going to be a real disciple. Right? It involves the whole person. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Last one. Last of my little... Nope, that's, that's not true. I got two more. <clears throat> Here's one that I've done more times than I can count. What is an MC? Anybody want to shoot a guess on that one? What's an MC? Missional community. <laughs> All right, what is it though? When I, listen, nobody in the Quad Cities used that kind of language when we planted 12 years ago. Uh, so I'd be like, we're, we're, starting, we're starting a missional community. A group of people, group of people who want the same mission. All right. All right. Good. Good. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Most people thought it sounded something like a cult or something, right? Like, I don't know what this thing is. So what we started doing is most of the time when I described what an MC was, people would say, oh, it's a small group. And I'd be like, well, it's a smaller group, but if you've been to a small group and you think that's what an MC is, that's not what an MC is, right? An MC is much more than just a small group. And then I would start describing them and I'd be like, well, you know, one of the things that we do is we're on mission to a certain piece, uh, a people and a place. And so they're like, oh, so it's like a social, and this is the word they would use, like social activist group. (laughs) Like, oh, you serve the poor, you serve the, oh, it's like a social activist. And I'd be like, no, it's it's not a social activist group. it's, It's not that. I'd say, well, well we, we usually meet together. Mine is like on Tuesday night. Oh, it's a weekly meeting. And then I'd say, well, no, we do gather together on a weekly meeting, but it's more than just a weekly meeting because it's a family of missionary servants learning to live all of life to the glory of God. Now you can kind of see where we're going. And then they'd be like, well, well do, you, do you like talk about the Bible? I'm like, yeah, we talk about the Bible. Every single week we talk about the Bible. Oh, so it's like a Bible study. And I'm like, well, no, it's not a Bible study. Here's my problem with Bible studies. I love Bible studies. I want to have more Bible studies. But most of us are educated way beyond our level of obedience. Most people have way more Bible knowledge than they're actually applying. Right? And we want to apply the Bible. We want to be disciples. I don't care if you know what all the beasts in Revelation mean, okay? I really don't. I want to know how are you loving your wife? How are you making disciples in your, in your own family? How are you living in community? That's what matters, right? Not that you have, you know, all the ec- expert, expertise on eschatology. Oh, and then I would tell them, like, sometimes we share stories and people are going through problems 
And so we will help them in their marriage. We'll help them go through things. And then they would say something like, oh, so it's, it's like a support group. And of course, I would say, well, kind of. It's kind of like a support group, but it's not like a support group because sometimes we just have fun. Sometimes we just throw a pool party and we hang out and we invite the neighbors. And then they're like, what, it's like a party? I'm like, well, no, it's not just like a party because sometimes we get in people's business and it's really serious, <laughs> right? But here's my point. What is an MC? An MC is not any one of these things. An MC is all of these things. And you will go in and out of these things. There'll be times where you're in a curriculum and you're studying the Bible and then somebody's going to walk in and they're going to have serious family issues and you're going to have to talk about those issues, right? The other thing is prayer meeting, right? We, we, we pray. We pray every week, right? Is it a prayer meeting? Well, we pray every week, but no, it's not just a prayer meeting. So an MC is, is a people living in community and on mission, learning to live all of life to the glory of God. And your MC should be doing all of those things at some point. Now, why? We see all of these things happening in Acts chapter 2. We see them praying together. We, is, it a, is it a weekly dinner night? You know, what, what are those things you, people tell me about those dinner clubs? Is it a dinner club? Well, no, but we eat good food every week. If you don't eat good food, sorry, you're in a bad MC. <clears throat> uh, but why? Okay, remember our rhythms. We listen, we bless, we eat, we recreate, right? We do all of these things because this is what we are. We're human beings being renewed in the image of God. And this is how we make disciples. So what is an MC? It's not any of these things, but at times it's all of these things, right? So this is my napkin theology on what an MC is or is, is not, all right? Last, last thing. <clears throat> I know this is a lot, but you're almost done. Last napkin theology. And this is going to be my worst one. My worst drawing. I need my wife just to do this for me. Actually, maybe I'm gonna put double doors on the church. There we go. Put a little cross up here so you know what's going on. All right. Here is the home. I'm just gonna call it the sanctuary and the city. When we, this is where we have MCs. In people's homes, this is obviously Sunday, and this is, uh, you know, mon Monday through Saturday, right? Every day. This is where we so think about it like this. These are our three contexts for doing ministry. We have our Sunday gathering. We want people. Now, let me just go with where we began. We began in the home. When most people say, hey, I'm starting a church, this is what they thought. I meant when I was starting a church. But I wanted to start a church here because I wanted to teach people how to live like I just showed in that, what is an MC? How to live in community and on mission. How to be disciples of Christ differently. Not just consumers that come on Sunday morning. So we started in homes with missional communities. And those missional communities, and what, what do we do? We, look, we work here. We play here in the city. We go golfing. We go to gym. We Shop, we, we do all the stuff down here in the city and we're inviting people into our homes, into our missional community, having dinner, these things. This is the primary place a lot of discipleship takes place, okay? And so what we would do, we'd have these MCs, they would grow, they would multiply. Once we got to three missional communities, then we started our Sunday gathering. So we had about, 50 people living like disciples in community and on mission together, serving the city, inviting people, 
And then, now the goal is to get people from missional community into the Sunday gathering, into the sanctuary. And here in the sanctuary, this is where we, we get discipled in a, in a different way. We've got liturgy. Liturgy is forming our habits. So if you think about that heart, head, heart, hands. If I want to get fit, what's going, to, what's going to help me more? Creating the habit of waking up early and just going or waiting until I feel like working out? Creating the habit. But hear that. If I want to get fit, a habit is more important than the desire. The desire will come and go. But if I can create a habit it's, and I just get myself out the door and I get on the treadmill and I get into the gym, I can work myself into feeling it, right? In one sense, that's what liturgy does. The rhythm of our Sunday gathering. It teaches us the rhythm. It gets us out of, of am I feeling, what am I feeling right now? Read the words, Show up on Sunday morning. Learn to confess your sins. Learn to hear and receive forgiveness. Listen to the word of God. That's why we do the rhythms. Liturgy, this is what is so crazy, shapes what we love. Liturgy, our habits shape what we love. If you start running, you'll hate it. The more you run, the more you'll like it. It's bizarre. I promise, try it, okay? It takes a while, but it's true, right? So creating a habit. So Sunday morning, we're listening to the word of God. We're singing and worshiping God together. We're taking the Lord's Supper and the sacraments. That all happens here. And then what, again, I said this already, what's the last thing that we do when we leave here on a Sunday morning? We're sent, look, we're sent back out into the world as missionaries. Now, this is how we started the church, and now things have, they're, they're, this, we, this is still great, but we also sometimes, look, from the world, from the city, people come to Sunday morning first. Sometimes people come to Sunday morning first. And they come here, and Scott does an announcement, right? <laughs> Hopefully they meet some people, and the goal, it's great, they're here to worship God, but is this our goal? for them to come on Sunday morning and worship God? No, what's our goal? Make disciples. So in order to make disciples, we got to get them in the home, right? We got to get them into a missional community where they're, because in, right here, this is not in community and on mission. Yes, sir. So should we invite them to MC first? Great question. Should we invite people to MC first or should we invite people to Sunday first? I say it 100% depends on the person. If a person has a ton of church hurt and they don't want anything to do with this, then you say, oh, no, no, no. Dude, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about this. These people will listen to you. These people care about you. We got some good food. We're gonna... And you, you bring them here first, right? If they're a complete outsider, have never been to church, you gotta t have a relationship with that person. And, and you know, and, and it's a, you gotta trust the spirit. Because obviously you get them here and I can really tick them off and they never come back or the Spirit of God can speak to them, right? And they, and they like it. I, have, I don't know. But day by day, the Lord was adding to their numbers. Day by day. Not just when they were gathered on, right in the temple. So there's some people that you know if they're like really relational, they're probably gonna like missional community. Invite them to MC first. But I just say, do both. You might just need to do both. Oh, I got something going on on Sunday. I can't be there on Sunday. Okay, cool. Well, I got this thing on Tuesday night. How about that? Or vice versa, right? I don't know how, the, how God's going to work. But so we used to say, this is the front door of our church. Now we say we have two front doors to our church. But the goal is to whatever, it's to get them. Now look, and then back into MCs, they're living in community on mission and they get sent back in the city to live as disciples of Christ. This is our philosophy of ministry. This is the three contexts where we do ministry. Because listen, you remember when we say we want to plant church, we want to make disciples, we want to make disciples, plant churches, and renew the city. 
When, we, when I'm talking about sending people out, I'm talking about I want people to go start businesses. I'm talking about I want people to live like Christians out in the world. I want them to go renew the city. That, that's, you know, maybe start nonprofits and different things like that. Like we want more churches, more missional communities, and a city that loves Jesus. That's the goal. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. <clears throat> I've got, we're going to change, we're going to change, uh, change gears here. And I only got 10 minutes to do it. I want you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll, listen, when, uh, so some of this, this uh, membership class is for you just to kick the tires, right? Kick the tires, see what we believe, see what we're all about. This, you just saw, like this is what I, this is our goal. The elders here, this is what we want for you. We want you literally for the rest of your life to live in community, to come on Sunday morning, and to serve the Lord in the city, in, in, in wherever God's placed you. This is what, we're gonna con constantly encourage you to do these things, okay? This is what it means to be a part of Sacred City. Um, as you work through the process online, you're going to eventually get to a, a, a document called the Sacred City Covenant. And the covenant, it's just literally lots of scriptures, says what the elders are, are promising. That's what a covenant is. Um, we're, we're promising to do for you and things that you promise to do as a member of the church. All of the things that you're promising to do are just scripture. What, what God tells us to do. Like that, remember that so in community and on mission, that in community, there's over 40 scriptures in the New Testament that are called the one another's. They just say, love one another, bear one another's burdens, take care of one another. Those are the things that God calls us to do, right? And so as we do those things together, we grow as a disciple, all right? Now this one, this, this what I'm going to talk about right now, I'm just going to tell you, it's called biblical stewardship, and it's, it can be a hot topic for some. This is why you have a whole packet that I, listen, I want you to read this packet, okay? You have a whole packet. We've given you a book that if you want to read the book. All I'm going to do today, because if you guys know, one of the things when we started Sacred City, I said, I'm not taking an offering. I came from churches that really hammered the offering and they begged for money all the time, and the people that I was on mission to said, the church only wants my money. And I said, well, I don't want your money. I want, to make a, I want to make you into a disciple. So I said to the Lord, I'm not taking an offering. And everybody that was coaching me said, that's really dumb. You should take offerings. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. And we've taken one or two, two offerings in 12 years. One of them was to outfit a kid's building, and the second one was to give away to 180. Yeah, that's the only time we've taken any type of special offerings. Other than that, our finances come through the giving of our members, the tithing of our members. 95% of people give online, like in a weekly, monthly, whatever it is, fashion. And we set our budget on our members' giving. That's how we, that's how we determine our budget. It's just off of our, off, off of our members' giving. And God's been really faithful to us. We've always been in the positive. We've always been in the black. We got to buy this building. God's been really gracious to us. So I just say, hey, I don't, we don't harp on it. We have one announcement about where the, the boxes are on Sunday morning to remind people that it is an act of worship. But we, put, we try to put Jesus first and let Jesus, take care of, let Jesus take care of our finances. But go to Luke chapter 11. This is how Jesus talks about this issue of tithing. And the, the word tithe just means 10%. You hear that? The word tithe means 10%. Verse 37. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. A Pharisee is a religious leader. So he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. 
And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Okay, you remember that? Remember this where I had the three circles here? We had the head, the heart, and the hands. Well, I just did it backwards, whatever. I'm just going to do it like this. Head, heart, hands. Pharisees knew how to tithe. They knew God wanted them to give 10%. They had the right thinking. They tithed. Did you see how? Look, look what he says there. First off, he says, inside, that's what we're talking about, the heart, full of greed and wickedness. Inside, their heart was full of greed and wickedness. Now walk, look at verse 40. You fools, did not he who made the outside also make the inside? But give as alms, that's give financially, those things that are within. And behold, everything is clean for you. But look, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. Here's what Jesus is getting at. These Pharisees, look, they, they were so scrupulous in their tithing, they went to their garden out back and cut off 10% of their herbs and brought even their herbs to give. Right? So outwardly, they looked like they were just meticulous. They were legalists. They were the best of the best. They knew what God required of them. They had a good head, good hands, but what does Jesus go after? Their heart. Inside, you're full of greed. So here we see two modes of obedience. There's external obedience and there's internal obedience. And God doesn't give a rip about external obedience. He wants our heart. Does he want us to obey him? Yes. You can't, you can't love him with all your heart and not give with your hands. You can't. Right? But he doesn't care about just giving. He wants our heart. Now look what he says there. He says this, these, so tithing, tithing you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So he's like, you were right in what you did. You were right in tithing, but you're wrong in neglecting, uh, what do you say? In neglecting justice and the love of God, right? Yeah, justice and the love of God. So, the goal is to give, guys, out of right here. The goal is to give, understanding what God requires of us. That's in the packet, that's in the book. Seeing that how much God has given to us, that we're just stewards. Every dollar, God chose to make you successful, whatever level of success you're at, God chose to do that for you, right? God gave you all this, and one of the ways that we love God back is by using our hands, by giving financially back to him. And scripture calls that tithing. And tithing means we give 10% back to God. Now, there's lots of questions on this. They're in that packet. Let me just tell you this. Oftentimes, we meet people, and through circumstances, maybe they've had health problems, maybe they've made bad financial decisions in the past, tithing at 10%, is not a requirement before you become a member. But giving is. And, and wanting to give is a requirement. And so we've had people that come in and say, hey, I'm a student. <laughs> well, they're like, how much do you make? Uh, negative 60,000 a year. And I'm like, can you tithe all that? That's negative, no. So they come in, they don't tithe, right? They don't have jobs. But Let's say you've got debt, you've got all these different things. We have a financial team and deacons of finance that are financial planners. They will sit down with you. They will teach you how to manage your finances. They will teach you how to pay off debt. They will start you maybe at 2% or 3% of giving. And then they'll say, next year, we're going to pay off some debt. Next year, we'll go to 4% or 5% or whatever. And maybe it takes five years to get you at tithing, to get you at 10%. All we care about is the heart behind it. All we care about is that you aren't, aren't full of greed and wickedness like the Pharisees and you're just here to consume. But if you want to lean into it and follow Jesus, that we're about discipleship. And discipleship, Jesus takes us where we are, but he loves us too much to, to leave us there. He, he moves us forward, right? And so we have people, and, and believe me, you think, oh, I'm embarrassed. I'm, guys, 
we, we've dealt with everything, right? We've dealt with everything. Hundreds of thousand dollars in debt, all kind of craziness. Uh, we've, we've dealt with everything. The goal is to honor the Lord with our wealth, right? To honor the Lord with what he's given us, wherever, wherever that is, right? Wherever we are. And so one of the questions that the elders will ask you, you know, whoever, whatever elder you meet with, when you go through the covenant, there's a spot in the, there's a spot in the covenant that says, do you commit to be a giver at the sacred city or a tither or something like that? And then it says, uh, what amount are you committing to give? That's a monthly amount. The reason we ask for that monthly amount is because that's how we build our budget, right? We build our budget. So if it's $300, we'll say this, is that 10% for you? This is not to shame anybody. This is because it's our job as elders to help oversee you. Just, no, that's not, that's not 10%. That's like 2%. Okay, tell me what's up. Where are we at? What's going on, right? Do you need to meet with the deacon of finance? Do we need anything? We, we want to help you get to where God's called you to be, right? Not trying to judge anybody or anything like that, but we want to be responsible and we want to be conservative when it comes to our budget. And so we only budget off of our members' pledges. That's how we budget how much we're going to spend this next year, whether we can do different projects and, and, and different things. Okay, so um, any questions on this? Thoughts, concerns? Yes, sir. The tithe, like tithe and offerings, they're two different things, right? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, tithes and offerings are two different things. So, so at Sacred City, and, and, and that packet will go through it. That packet will go through some of those things. So taxes screw things up. In the Old Testament, they gave approximately 30, around 30% 30 of their income when you include tithes, alms, so offerings, and then all the feasts that they had to do and sacrifices. But that was also a part of their taxes, basically, right? And we, we get, don't get me on that, right? So we, we believe that you should be giving 10% to the church, 10% to the church so that we can pay do the ministry, keep the lights on, do the things that we need to do. But above and beyond that would be offering. And that's primarily what's going to happen in missional community. Making meals for somebody that gets sick. Somebody need, maybe somebody's car breaks down, you need to pool some resources to do that. Serving people. Um, so we don't have a, an official benevolence ministry at Sacred City. Our benevolence happens in our missional community. That's how we do benevolence. Okay, any other questions? All right, did everybody get signed up on that schedule? If, if one of those times didn't work out for you, you can talk to any of the elders here and we can find a, a separate time to squeeze you in. I'm not sure how many slots that were open, how many slots we had. If we have to add more, we can. Okay? All right, so now your next step it's to finish the online process and schedule a meeting. All right? Are we good? All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here and giving us your time. We're really thankful that God's brought you to Sacred City. We hope that you are uh, learning how to be a disciple who makes disciples.